Uh, it is a real pleasure to be here at the Edinburgh Book Festival. Uh, it's a real pleasure to meet all of you guys. Um, I hope that we're going to have a really fun, interactive session uh, talking about a story called His Royal Whiskers that I've written and talking about how I created that story as well. So it's going to be the story and the story behind the story. Story and the story behind the story. And maybe at the end, we might, Chris, have some questions about stories as well. Yes, might absolutely. Stories, yep. stories behind the stories, questions about stories, just essentially, yay, story time! Just that, essentially, is what we're going to be doing. <laughs> so, before I start, could we just move on to the next slide? We need a secret signal, don't we, for the... Has anyone got an idea for a secret signal that I could... Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be the secret <laughs> signal for the next slide. Uh, I do have a confession to make, and that is... Uh, that around about Christmas time last year, I became a dad for the first time. Ooh. Picture, you ask? Why, yes, of course. Here's the little monster. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's my son you're talking about. That's nowhere near big enough. And oh, for how cute he is. Here's my boy. Oh. <laughs> Lovely. That's really good. Uh, very, very good. I was in a school in, um, where was I? I was in a school in Saigon once, and I showed them a picture. And um, they were like really little kids. You know the kids whose like, heads are bigger than their bodies? <laughs> like those kids, the like him basically. His body's actually like this big compared to... Um, and uh, I don't think they really... I don't know if they make that sound out in Vietnam when like something's cute, like the kind of ah sound. So I was like, that's nowhere near big enough. Make it bigger. And they all went, ah Like that. Like he was a kind of baby Godzilla or something. Um, but I had, yeah, I, had be I became a dad for the first time uh, back in Christmas. So I haven't slept since Christmas 2016. And even on Christmas, I wasn't sleeping because I was way too excited for Santa. So uh, if I make any mistakes, if I kind of forget something that I'm supposed to say, Chris, I'm sure you'll remind me because we've had a bit of a script. chat. We'll go on or off script. Uh, but just treat me like one of those very small children that has a ginormous head. Um, and always a bogey as well, isn't there? There's always a bogey with those kids. Why don't they wipe their noses? I don't know. Um, and just be very kind to me and just, just, just wait patiently, and I will get there eventually. Uh, so moving on, we're going to talk about his royal whiskers, which, as Chris said, uh, is kind of inspired by a what if. And we're going to talk about all the things that you need to be inspired by to come up with a story. Uh, but for me, there's kind of like several basic ingredients. You need this kind of like what if question, this magic question which often kick-starts your imagination to start wondering about things. Uh, you need some characters. You need something to go wrong. And as Chris said, several things in this story go really, really, really badly wrong. Uh, so we've got characters. You have your what if, your uh, characters, your problem. You need your story to take place somewhere. So you need a setting. And finally, at the end of your story, you need your characters to find something. It might be finding their own confidence. It might be finding an amazing piece of treasure. Who knows? But you need them to discover something at the end. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about those sort of four ingredients, and we're going to have a go at coming up with some ourselves. But the what if for his royal whiskers is what if you were really, really good at brewing magical potions? It's a really great what if, actually. And the reason it seized my imagination is because not only am I a writer, but I love to read as well. I imagine lots of you guys love to read. Hands up if you do. Few. It would be very embarrassing if there were no hands up, wouldn't there? <laughs> great. And even some grown-ups. That's great as well. Uh, I love to read, and I love to read stories uh, that have magic potions in them. And that's that question, that what if, what if you could brew magic potions, that's inspired storytellers for... Uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of years. And I thought we'd start off with one of several games that we're going to play today. Does anyone like playing games? Brilliant. Chris loves playing. Chris loved playing Formula One racing on his PlayStation so much that he built a cockpit for a car in his own bedroom, right? <laughs> Was that a really embarrassing thing that I shouldn't have shared? It's just that story I told you before to put you in confidence and yeah. <laughs> Right, okay, I'm really sorry. Uh, but yeah, I think, that's, I think that shows that you're, that's a really awesome thing to do. I think, I think it makes really me great. really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Um, so one of the first of our many games is, I'm going to show you some pictures uh, that are from stories inspired by that same what if, what if you could brew, brew potions. 
And uh, I wonder if we can be extremely well-read audience members and find out what those stories are. So the first one is this one, which is an easy one, isn't it? It's an easy peasy one. Um, just, you're gonna have to shout really loud because I've got a mic and you don't. What do you reckon it is? You're absolutely right, mate. It's George's Marvelous Medicine, where George makes an incredible potion, but something goes wrong because he ends up giving it to, can anyone remember? Grandma. And grandma is not a lovely grandma like both of my grandmas. Grandma is a horrible, wrinkly grandma that, actually, you don't have to be wrinkly. I don't know why I said wrinkly, because wrinkly <laughs> is great. Uh, a horrible grandma that just sits in a chair and talks about eating slugs all day, right? She's gross. And he makes a medicine to try and make her fabulous and marvelous. Uh, and stuff goes wrong, doesn't it? How about this? So you're one for one at the moment. One for one. You're pretty good games masters. How about this one? I don't think I know that one. Yeah. And just as a bit of a factoid about this, Eddie Redmayne has been around the festival, hasn't he? So yes. If you see him, obviously don't, don't harangue and harass Eddie Redmayne. He's... <laughs> here just to have fun, but uh, Eddie Ray Redmayne, AKA Newt Scamander, has been seen around the festival, which is pretty awesome. Um, but who's this guy? Well, what store is it from? Yeah, Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Does anyone know what? Because there are seven Harry Potter stories and an eighth Harry Potter story, and then a weird Harry Potter story with Eddie Redmayne in it. <laughs> Does anyone know what story this one is from? Because we're two for two at the moment. Yes, mum. Goblet of Fire, absolutely. We're three for three now. What house would you be in, by the way? Gryffindor, I'm Slytherin, so... <laughs> uh, yeah, and does anyone know who's, which character this is? Can we go four for four? Yes, m mums are just real <laughs> Potter aficionado. Uh, uh, whatever, however you say that word, yeah. It's Mad-Eye Moody, or is it? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So we're four for four at the moment. And Mad-Eye Moody, who is an incredible professor, he's an aura, isn't he, in, in, in Hogwarts, he's got a potion in his hand, and that potion, J.K. Rowling was very, very, very clever, a genius at coming up with names for her potions. Does anyone remember what this potion was called? Yeah? Polyjuice Potion. And what does Polyjuice Potion change? What does it change? It makes you from quiet to sneezy. Maybe? Anyone? What is it? Yeah. It can, like, it can transform you into someone else. Yeah, it can transform not necessarily your insides into someone else, but your outsides, would you say? Your appearance into someone else. Absolutely. Uh, so Professor Mad-Eye Moody there could take a swig of Polyjuice Potion. I think you have to put like a hair of someone that you want to change into it, right? Yeah, and then you transform into them and you look exactly like them. So I might actually not even be... Sam Gayton standing in front of you. I could be, I don't know, Donald Trump. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not Donald Trump. Uh, believe me. Uh, yeah, so you're, wait, you're five for five at the moment. And what about this one? This is the last one and probably the hardest one. Hmm. This is an old story. So all of the old people, you're not allowed to answer this. Oh, we've got some, uh, shall we have a guess? Shall we go for it? Yeah. We're five for five at the moment. It doesn't matter if we go six, five for six, that's fine. Yes. Oh my goodness. Can everyone give the young genius at the back of the room a round of applause? And doesn't it feel good? It feels great, doesn't it? I think we should actually start a campaign where in crowded places like train stations and stuff like that, um, over the tannoy, there'll be an announcement and they'll be like, could everyone please applaud the uh, man in the coat over here? And then everyone just goes... <laughs> just to brighten up people's day, because it would be great. Uh, yeah, you're right, it's from A Midsummer Night's Dream, which is a different type of story to the others, because it's not a book or a film, uh, it is a play. A play by one of our most famous playwrights. Does anyone know? Whoa, yes. William Shakespeare, absolutely right. And William Shakespeare wrote this story about the, swat, the what if of if, what if you could brew uh, a love potion? 
And not just like, I love you guys. You guys clap me and now I love you guys. I love potion like, <laughs> I have a have a love potion. I don't know why anyone would create something so disgusting, but they did. And it falls onto and it gets taken by the Queen of the Fairies. And the love potion is so strong that it makes her fall in love with the first person that she, that she sees. And she falls in love with someone who's got a donkey's head for a head. And their name is Bottom. <laughs> <laughs> that person was waiting for it. They're like, say the name, say the name, say the name! <laughs> <laughs> that love potion is so strong, it makes a queen kiss a bum. <laughs> you guys are very good. And does anyone know who these guys are? No? Well, I'll tell you. These guys are my potion makers, my alchemists. And they live in a kind of fairy tale world. Their names are Peter and Teresa. And they both got very different skills. Peter is a math magician, a math magician, which means he's incredible with numbers and logical thinking uh, and just memorizing facts and things like that. He's got that type of brain. Does anyone here think that if they were living in this kind of fairy tale world, they'd, they'd be a kind of math, ma math magician? Yeah, absolutely. We've got a few potential math magicians here. And Teresa, she has a different job. She has the job of the kitchen spice monkey. <laughs> so I, n I don't usually get a laugh from that, but that's great. <laughs> yeah, the spice monkey in the kitchen has to wander around. And she has, you can see there, lots and lots and lots and lots of different pockets. And she has to go around to all of the soups and all of the broths and all of the food frying and sizzling and baking. And she has to get all of the different pinches of chili powder and rosemary and sage and stuff out of all of her pockets and sprinkle them amongst all of the different dishes. So Teresa is really smart, not in a kind of like, uh, headway, but in a kind of intuitive way. She just kind of feels her way about thinking about things and combining stuff together. And together, these two characters, they decide that they're going to start dabbling in alchemy, in potion making. And they decide that secretly, because potion making in this fairy tale country is illegal, and if you get found out that you're potion making, you could, get, you, could be in, you could be in store for a, a, a short, sharp shock on a dull, dark block. And they decide in secret that they're going to make a potion. And I'm not going to tell you what potion they make and what it changes stuff into. I'm just going to read to you a little bit about the stuff that they put in to their potion and the stuff that they do, the method that they use for their potion, and see if you can think about what this potion might be. Dusk until dawn, in the cramped little laboratory. Tired days and frantic nights, giddy with secret alchemy. Crowding around the cauldron fire, dizzy with the heat. Boil it up, simmer it down. Peter's pacing, Teresa's frown. Mix it all together and whirl it all apart. Something isn't working, go back to the star. How do we get whiskers to grow? Hmm. Try whisking the potion, then throw in the whisk. Give it a try, what's the risk? Fizzle, sizzle, hiss, spit, look out! Boom! Wave away the fumes. When will it work? Soon. Stir in clover. Fold in cream. Pause and stir. Pause and stir. Pause four times to make four pours. The tips of kitchen knives for claws. A hundred other things and more. Boil it down to treacly gloop. Thicker than soup. Thicker than stew. Thicker than porridge. Thick as glue. Make it glop and gunk and guck. Just one drop will be enough. This stuff is seriously strong. It'll change things for a long, 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 long time. Do you think maybe we should make it weaker? Don't be silly. Make it stronger, Peter. All spring and summer. That's how it went. The great furry experiment. What do you reckon, Peter and Teresa? Yeah, go on. Uh, making a potion that changes stuff into, what do you reckon? And you at the back as well, That you there? With the blonde hair, with the blonde hair and the ponytail? Yeah. Cats. cats, you both said cats and you're both absolutely right. Peter and Teresa are making a potion that changes things into fluffy, wuffy, kitty witties. Oh. OMG.
Now, why did I choose Love Your Wifey Kitty Witties? Because uh, whilst I uh, write, I sometimes like to distract myself by using the internet. And going on the internet, there are a load of really, really funny cat gifts. For example, OMG Cat. Or Puss in Boots Cat. <laughs> Actual Puss in Boots. With some little cat rocking out on a ukulele as well. Um, or even, this is, this, is, uh, this is Puss in Boots Cat. This is what it would actually look like to actually put shoes on a cat. Uh, especially the end. I can't believe you're laughing. I'm going to report you all to the RSPCA. Uh, yeah, it's pretty funny, isn't it? Um, I left this on once and I was trying to do my, my talk and the kids were just going, ah, and I was like, guys, simmer down, simmer down. And they just kept going on and on and on. Uh, so I thought we could be inspired by that what if too. What if you were going to make a potion? What if you were an incredible math magician or incredible at mixing stuff together like Teresa the Spice Monkey is and you decided you were going to dabble in alchemy? What would you change stuff into? Has anyone got any ideas and maybe we'll pick one and see if we can create a potion. Yeah, what about you? Again? Pigs. Pigs. Yeah, that would be cool. You'd never run out of bacon sandwiches. Yeah. Rats. Rats. Wow, yeah. Maybe the Pied Piper of Hamlin made that potion. I don't know. Unicorns. Oh, that would be so boss. That would be great. Yeah. Nintendos, that'd be awesome. What if you put it on a Nintendo? Would it turn into, I don't know, Mario just comes alive, yeah. Um, Cling film? Oh, I see, yes, absolutely. And you could also um, wrap up your own sandwiches, couldn't you? <laughs> if you ever went to school, you'd just be like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, what? A robot. a robot. Make stuff mechanical. Yeah, change stuff mechanical. Yeah? Lemmings. Lammies. What are that? Oh, lambs. Oh, Aww. that would be so cute, wouldn't it? That would be great. Last one. Minions. Minions. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. I mean, first of all, parents, can I just congratulate you on your imaginative children? Because uh, usually when I do this, um, the kids is, well, every kid is just like, oh, 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 poo! <laughs> and we have to spend about 15 minutes talking about changing stuff into poo, uh, and then I have to ex explain that people already change stuff into poo, don't they? Um, that's mainly what we do. Um, so we're going to go for a recipe, a recipe for, um, I liked robots, actually. I like robots, because I think that could give us um, like a load of stuff to work with. So think of all the things. I'm going to give you 10 seconds to turn to the person next to you and think of all the things that make up a robot, and not just the, um, the actual physical things, but like the, the other things as well. Like maybe the internet could be part of that, or maybe... Um, a uh, voice that speaks like this, I don't know. Um, maybe a uh, really, really clever brain or something like that. You could think of all different things uh, that could go into that robot. Sights, smells, objects, uh, feelings, whatever you wanted. Have a think about some recipe ingredients. Off you go. What are we going to call this potion, Chris? A recipe for... you got to use alliteration. Okay, a recipe for robot robotics. Robotics, robotic, uh, robotica, robotica, uh, something, maybe we'll just add on a little robotica. Um, maybe we just call it robotica. Roboticitis? That's Roboticitis. a Roboticitis. Um, robotical. Bot robotical Botanical. How about that? That's fantastic, Sam. Robotical Botanical. Okay, we've got a name. We've got a name. Me and Chris come up with a name. Uh, a potion, a recipe for... We tried to do some alliteration. So, a recipe for Robotical Botanica. It's called Robotical Botanica. Everyone say it. Robotical Botanica. <laughs> Robotical Botanica. Yes. 
Robotical Botanica, a potion that changes stuff into robots. In your cauldron, three things go. Anyone got any ingredients to add in to Robotical Botanica? Someone who hasn't spoken, you haven't spoken yet? Yeah, you're at the back. Or let's just stick with metal first. What type of metal? Normal metal. Normal metal. Yeah. With a headband. Rainbows. I like that. Yeah, because often robots have like loads of multicolored wires and stuff in them. So they would need that coloring, wouldn't they, to make them all multicolored. Normal metal, rainbows, and... Oh, you haven't spoken yet. Let's have you in the cap. And rose petals. Oh, that's a very interesting thing to go. That's very interesting. Normal metal, rainbows, and rose petals. Stir it round, bring it to the boil. Can anyone think of an action that we would do? Do the robot, maybe. An action that we would do to uh, our big cauldron full of stuff that would help robotify it, make it a bit more roboty. Yeah. Do the Egyptian. Okay, do a contrary dance move. <laughs> do the Egyptian, then add, let's have a fourth, let's have a fourth wacky ingredient. Fourth wacky ingredient. So, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, anyone who hasn't spoken about Yes, you. Then add rusty flowers. Wow. That, I like that, because that goes with our rose petals as well. Maybe we could have rusty rose petals as well as rusty flowers. Great. So, in your cauldron, three things go. Normal metal, rainbows, and rose petals. Stir it around, bring it to the bowl, do the Egyptian, and then add rusty flowers. Cool. However, every potion, because it's so powerful, needs a warning label, right? Warning. If you add in... Can we think of an ingredient? Yeah. If you add in a kettle... <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Strange thing. I, l I also really like that there's some alchemists somewhere that would be like, okay, just add in the kettle just after... Oh, no, sorry, the warning label says not to. If you add in a kettle, this potion does strange things to you. Your nose turns... What happens to your nose? What happens to your nose? Yeah. Your nose turns green. Your hair turns... Your hair turns... Yes, you... Purple? And you turn into a... And you turn into a... A minion! <laughs> Brilliant! Wow, what a potion. Do you see how sitting with that what if, that question, just sitting with it for a little while and letting your brain kind of bubble away, you can come up with the start of a story, right? But anyway, rewind, back to cats. So. <laughs> back to cats. I created a poem, my potion, changes stuff into cats, and it's called Catastrophica. And it's called Catastrophica because it causes something to go wrong. Of course, if you're going to have a story, you can't just have making a potion. The potion has to cause something to go wrong, right? Your characters have to overcome some sort of obstacle. And the obstacle in my story is that accidentally they spill the potion onto the prince of a very, very powerful warlike empire. Which, as you can imagine, really annoys his dad. Does his dad look like someone you would want to annoy? No. no. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's the girl in the front row who has a wish to get her head chopped off. You wouldn't want to annoy him, would you? And so this guy, whose name is the Tsar, says, I'm going to do my best Tsar impression now. Peter! You half can be Peter. Teresa, you have changed my boy into an adorable fluffy wuffy kitty witty. This makes me mad! Yeah. Peter. Yeah. Teresa. Yeah. Yeah. Stop answering back or I'll chop off your head right now! <laughs> <laughs> How dare you heckle at this very serious moment! You have one chance and one chance only 
to save yourself from a quick, sharp shock to the neck. And that is that you must provide a solution to this problem that you've created. You must turn my boy back into a conqueror like me, because I want an heir that can conquer the entire world. Okay? That's what he says to them. Uh, Peter and Teresa, part of the problem, really, of Peter and Teresa is that their solution, because they're potion makers, invariably involves more potion making. What would your solution be? Peter's, I want you to think really logically about this solution because you're math magi magicians. Teresa's, I want you to think really zanily and bonkers about this because you are spice monkeys and you've probably had a bit too much chili powder this morning. <laughs> I want you to think about that and think if you could come up with a solution. Let's go. So much material, isn't there? There's, we're not going to be able to have a chance to do... Let's just do the rap. We won't do the, the consequences, really. Do you want to do the rap? Yeah, we're just going to do the rap. Okay. All right. Okay. Peters, what would your solution be? Peters. Yes, Peter. Peter, mum. Mum, Peter. Put the potion on the dad as well. Be like, oh, oh. yeah, sure, sure. I'll uh, catastrophic her. <laughs> yeah, that would be a good one. What would your solution be? Might double, might cancel out. Kind of like a um, multiplying two minuses. Yeah. Turn him inside out. <laughs> oh. So what is, oh my goodness. So his guts are all on the outside. <laughs> there we go, I fixed your son. <laughs> He's now a huge collection of tripe. Yes. Oh, feed him up into a giant cat and then he can conquer. Because after all, Lions are conquerors. They're king of the beasts, aren't they? And they're cats. What about you guys? What's your zany imaginative? I mean, really, you should have been. You were a secret Teresa, weren't you? Turn him inside out. <laughs> That's a Teresa answer, definitely. Yeah. Uh, what's that? Say it again. Brew, brew him, put him in the potion. Oh yeah, that's a very, that's probably quite a Peter. That's quite quite a Peter answer. That's very good. You two swap places. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, what's your... Go on the internet. <laughs> and look at cat gifts all day. <laughs> yeah. Rewind the spell. That's great. So create some other kind of potion that changes a remote control into like a time remote control and then rewind the spell and make, make it so you've never done it. All very sensible options. But Peter and Teresa actually go for your option. They decide that they're going to make Prince Alexander, who you just saw back there, who is the adorable fluffy wuffy kitten, into a conqueror by increasing his size. And they create a second potion called a gargantua potion. And the gargantua potion does this to Prince Alexander. Yeah, it's more, it's less, oh, more, oh. Because he's like a fluffy, wuffy T-Rex now, isn't he? <laughs> Let me read to you what happens to Prince Alexander. And of course, of course, the more potions that you do, the more things that you brew, the more problems happen in your story. The first week of Welkin was full of changes. The days turned shorter and drearier. The nights grew glittering and cold. Down from the wild northern waste, the wind began its slow, unceasing wail that would stretch on through Welkin and rise to a shriek when worsen came, until it got so loud and piercing it would sometimes shatter windows like an opera singer's high note. But it was Alexander that changed most of all. On Monday he was lion-sized. By Toil's Day he was elephant-sized. By War's Day, he was whale-sized. By Tsar's Day, he was dinosaur-sized. By Fur Day, after his fifth dose of gargantua potion, Prince Alexander was beyond colossal. By the way, in this country, there's only five days of the week because the Tsar is such a mean, nasty ruler that he killed off the weekend. 
I know. Prince Alexander entered and exited the Winter Palace in a specially made cat flap that was 70 feet high. He napped in the Hall of Faces, the only room he could now fit into, leaning his head on a tremendous pillow that had been stuffed with the wool of a hundred flocks of sheep. Since Wars Day, the Tsar had actually taken to sleeping on the prince. He would lie down in the fur that was long and reddish, golden and rippled like corn in the breeze. Alexander could leap across the river Ossia in a single bound. He could outrun the wind. He could unhorse a hundred knights with one fling swipe. His meow could be heard in far and distant countries where it was mistaken for the sound of the end of the world. Can we all do, rather than a sneeze, can we all do a really, really loud meow on three that is going to make the people in this tent over here think that the end of the world is coming? Ready? Three, two, one. <laughs> very, very good. And perhaps it was the sound of the end of the world because as he grew ever bigger, Alexander's thirst grew ever more insatiable. He had stopped drinking his milk out of saucers, then buckets, then bathtubs. They were all far too small now. Instead, he drank from the fountain in the palace courtyard, which had been disconnected from its usual water, su water supply and hooked up to the udders of a herd of cows. The prince's, the prince's appetite, too, had grown just as enormous as he had. By Tsar's day, Alexander was devouring a herd of cows for breakfast. Can everyone make the sound of a herd of cows being gobbled up by a giant kitten? Ready? Three, two, one. A shoal of fish for lunch. Fish don't really make a sound, do they? Yeah, that's good. That's good. Thanks, Dad. And an entire murder of crows for supper. Everyone make a, mur a murder of crows being murdered. Three, two, one. Thanks for the additional actions as well. <laughs> After four days of guzzling, the river Ossia was almost empty. The hills were bare and the forests were silent. Alexander was hoovering up every last scrap of food in the kingdom. Having eaten every animal for miles around, he was now starting on the poor creatures in the palace zoo. On fur day, Alexander gobbled up a camel. Camel's camel's right? Yeah, nice try. Some flamingos. Quite difficult animals to make the sound effects are, aren't they? Uh, a firebird, which gave him heartburn. A bile bear, which gave him stomachache. And a puffin, which made him out of breath. After dinner, several rare species that the Tsar had plundered from exotic lands, including two pygmy tigers, a gold feathered chicken that laid Fabergé eggs, and a glacier slug that Alexander nibbled on like a popsicle stick, were suddenly extinct. The people in the country of Petrosia were starting to grow increasingly nervous. So were Peter and Teresa.